Brother Matt's sermon will be in Revelation 3, 21. And it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Brother Matt's focus will be on sitting with Christ in his throne, but I wanted to introduce it by saying a few words concerning who will get this opportunity and why. We notice that this promise is conditional. He said that it is it it will be granted to him that overcometh. And so then, who is qualified to be an overcomer? This is going to be given to those who believe and are following Jesus. It requires us to have faith, perseverance, and patience. In this, we can be assured of the success of our own efforts because Jesus has already overcame. We have this advantage because he is in us. As long as we continue in the spirit, we will overcome. As long as we stay on the straight path and follow him, we will overcome. And as long as we fight and don't give up, don't give in to the temptation of the wicked one, we will overcome. As long as we keep our eyes on him, we will overcome, brethren. And we can do this because he has already overcame and is working on our behalf. I have, the, I have confidence in these words of Jesus when he said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He overcame that he might lead you to overcome. Surely greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. To those who follow Jesus and who take advantage of this provision, the, this promise is sure. We will be able to look forward to this great promise to sit with Jesus in his throne. Amen. Now, Brother Matt will come up and expound more on this glorious promise to us. Amen. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, this is a, a staggering thought, brethren. This is, this is a profound and a weighty promise. And, and uh, this is something that I hadn't put together in my mind previously, that th this promise is the promise that was given to the church at Laodicea. You know, you'd think that of all the churches that he would have given this promise to Smyrna, you know, or, or maybe one of the other churches that were doing really well. But no. He gives this promise out of all of the seven churches, the worst one to which he had nothing good to say. He gave him this promise. Uh, in this, we see that Jesus knows how to draw his people to him. We, we see the, the, the compassion, the mercy, the, the, the love of Jesus. That he is draw, he, he's desiring to draw them to him with bands of love and giving him this, this promise to grant them to sit with me in my throne. Uh, this, is, this is an incredible thing. Now when you think of the throne of God, when you think of the throne of Christ, what is it that you think of? What comes to your mind? And when, when we talk about a throne, we're not just talking about a really big, golden, fancy chair to sit down in and be comfortable, you know. That's a lot of people think about when I think of a throne, to think of the chair, you know. but. The, the throne's associated with power. We're talking about the place of influence, the place from which judgment comes forth. Well, we're talking about the seat of power, about the hub of divine activity. The throne of God is the center of everything that matters. It, the one who sits in this seat, who, who sits in this throne, is not merely a figurehead. We're not, we're not talking about someone who has really no qualifications to rule and to reign, but sits there just so that we can fill the position. He is the king, and there is a reason for that. What is established here in the throne remains established. And what is determined to be destroyed here in the throne, it, it cannot escape destruction. It is the habitation of the one who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. The determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, goes the, the, the purpose goes forth from here, from the throne. And this, incidentally, is presently where Jesus is reigning at the right hand of God. 
the government is on his shoulders from the throne. He is, he's exercising his dominion for the accomplishment of the purpose of God in the church. So, so, so presently, Jesus is filling this seat, and he is, be assured, he is filling it. He is head. He's been given to be head over all things to the church. There's a purpose for this. This is not, this is something of which the benefit that we now realize and enjoy. This is the reason why you are able to have the peace and the joy and the confidence that you have now, because Jesus inhabits this throne. Amen. So, in the present, we don't participate in this reign. This is something of which of which we benefit, but. What, what Jesus is saying here, that there is going to be a day, a, a coming day when our confirmation to and joining with Christ in his death and resurrection will be realized on a level which actually affords no level of separation to be made between us and him. But this is how close this joining is going to be. Uh, and in the seventh chapter of uh, Revelation, he gives this this, this testimony, John, he says, And this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, and clothed with right robes and palms in their hands. And, and this is what the Spirit asked them. He says, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And, and where came, where, you know, where did they come from? Well, he said, You know. This is what he tells him. <laughs> These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Think about that. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and he shall lead them unto living mount fountains of waters. Now what, what king in the earth can this can be said of in this capacity you know there's there's always a, a a great separation between the king and his servants there's going to be a kind of of intimate special fellowship between the church and christ that's it's unheard of this is a an, an, an amazing thing and, and and does this not remind you this this kind of language the pro uh, uh, that that God used when he gave the promise of the new covenant. He said that they, they, they shall not tell every man his brother and every man his neighbor to say, know the Lord. Why not? Because they all shall know me, even from the least of them to the greatest of them. This will be realized in the fulfillment of this time that, that so close will we be in our fellowship and confirmation to, to, to Jesus, that we will be included even in the affairs and matter, uh, matters of the government, that this glory that is, is to come will result of Jesus working through the church to accomplish a greater purpose, the nature of which we can scarce imagine in the present. And, and the means by which this is to be accomplished involves a co actually a cooperation and a fellowship between Christ and the church that is so intimate that they can actually be trusted even with the authority and power that's contained and represented in the throne. This is a weighty consideration. And I, I was reminded in these circumstances, it, it kind of reminds you of, of what happened to Joseph, does it not? That the one who was in, in prison, the one who was in shackles and in bondage, not too many days later, was exalted even to the throne. It, it, it required, for the, you know, how does this happen? Exactly how can we account for this? That one day you're in the prison and the next day you're, set, you, you're right at the right hand of Pharaoh. How does this happen? It required the one who had all power and all dominion to set him there. As it concerns us, the authority and the power that's involved in being made to sit in Christ's throne in this capacity is an authority which exists solely by virtue of the power of the edict of the king. Yeah. Now, to be sure, this is a subject of which we must be most careful. So that there is, there is, and there ever will be a reliance and a dependence on God through Christ Jesus for our very life. Amen. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. This is something that is never going to change. 
Jesus is the captain of our salvation. He is the head of the church. This will ever be for eternity. And, and, and he will even more so be in the ages to come in, in this elevated capacity. I was reminded of, of this word that uh, Paul gave in Ephesians 3. He said, unto him be glory in the church. How? How is this going to happen? By Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Now, at first glance to the casual observer, this, this, the idea this, this, that you could be trusted with this amount of responsibility would, could cause a man to wonder, you know, like, how could I possibly be qualified for such a work? How can one who was at one time himself in a standing where he was guilty before the judge of all the earth himself sit in judgment with Christ. How, how, how is that going to happen? How can one of the subjects of the king of kings, the one on whom the shoulders the government rest, be sat down in the throne with him? This is the man that we have to do, with which we have to do, brethren, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light who no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. But this is who we're going to be set down with. That's an incredible thing. Now, that being said, this should not cause us to marvel. This shouldn't cause us to say, you know, we talked about this recently in Nicodemus' response to Jesus' words concerning the new birth. This should not cause us to say, how can these things be? When you think about the work that we are presently involved in in the world and our lives on the earth, you, you can actually see the purpose of God in this. It, it actually makes good spiritual sense. And I'm thankful that the purpose of God is like this. We, we don't have to, to relegate ourselves to simple explanations of things. Uh, God has not been scarce in his revelations of these things to put us in a place where we must uh, labor in a realm of overwhelming mystery. This is not... I understand there's certain things of which we have not been given to know, but, but you can have confidence in this, that the Lord has given provision for us to see all that we need to see and know all that we need to know with, to be able to, with confidence and assurance, enter into this purpose. Now, as it concerns the present work at hand, God has given everything required for us to prepare ourselves to be equal to the task yes. of entering into the work of reigning with Christ in the Amen. ages to come. Amen. And in Revelation, it says twice, it uses this phrase that, that he has made us kings and priests unto God, his father. See, in the present time, we've all been given a kingdom, so to speak. We've all been given something to reign over, and this consists of our heart and our minds and our bodies. Yeah. Much like the children of Israel in their going into the land of promise, you've been given a land to subdue. You've been given a, a land to, to overtake the enemy and to inhabit and to dwell in. Every day you are making judgments. Every day you are weighing considerations. As it concerns your own individual sphere of influence, you are judging every single day. This is actually required for you to be able to, to live and, and um, obtain. Um, in, in Romans 6, he says this, this, this way. He reasons concerning this. He says... It, it requires for us to do a certain amount of spiritual reckoning for us to be able to, to live and in, in uh, put on the new man and put off the old man. He says, likewise, reckon ye yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin. This is something that, that, that needs to happen. Uh, let not sin therefore reign in your members. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to learn this. You have to exercise yourself in this. To, to not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but to yield yourselves unto God. Amen. And in the present, this is actually something that we are being cultured in. This is something that we are, are, are learning. Every day for the saint is one in which we are required to continue in this, this God-given authority, so to speak, via the new man and, and renewed spirit in Christ Jesus to put your body under. Uh, just make the flesh do what you want it to do. And, and, and to, to be sure, this is, this is what it requires. This is what you have to do. You know, when the flesh says, well, I, I just really don't feel like serving God today. 
And, and, and the flesh will say that. He said, I think I'd rather just, just lie, around, lie around and relax for a little bit. Just, just calm down. You know, why are you... This is what you have to do. I just, I really don't care what you want, flesh. I don't, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to do what you want me to because that's how, that's what got me in trouble in the first place was doing what you wanted me to do. You know, today, actually, by the grace of God, I'm going to force you to be my instrument. I'm actually going to force you to be a tool of righteousness under the glory of God. And that's that. And that's it. It sounds like a simple thing. We realize in experience that it's a little more complicated. But, but, but you can say that every once in a while. It's just good to just say, "Shut up, flesh. Just shut up." And, and every day requires you to gird up the loins of your mind, to to set your affection on things above. This is this is an an intentional action. And and. You know, the, the flesh is notoriously lazy in the area of thought. That there will never go one day by when your natural mind does not seek you seek to bring you into captivity to this kind of, of laziness. Have you ever heard people say, you know, I, I don't even want to think about that. It just makes my brain hurt to even think about that. I don't, I don't want to. Th That's like the, the epitaph over the grave of flesh is I don't even want to think about it, you know. When it, comes to, when it comes to God, this is the way the flesh is. It's like, I don't even want to... That just makes my head hurt to even think about that. But, but it, it's actually possible to live with, with this dominating thought in your mind of heavenly things. To, to be able to, 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 to track and to fellowship in your mind with the things of heaven. He doesn't say for, uh, um, in vain in Ephesians 4 that, that you put off the conformer lusts the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is, this is possible, brethren. This is not like a goal to attain to. This is actually the experience of the one who is walking according to the will of God in Christ Jesus. This is what it looks like for an individual who's participating and following the one who is leading many sons to glory. And this, this is part of our preparation of, 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 of being prepared to reign, to casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself up against the knowledge of God and bringing every, cap, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So as, as you learn to reign in this capacity, as you're found faithful in what you've been given a steward, to be a steward over in the present, you're being prepared for the greater work in the ages to come. And in this, I thought about this, this saying of Jesus. This will actually prove, prove this forever to be true, that he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So if you therefore, you've, you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, if you, if you can't even give your money to God, that's not even yours anyways that he's granted to you, that then who will commit to your trust the true riches? Amen. Is he really going to trust you with the riches of heaven if you can't even manage the money that he's given you, right? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, then who shall give you that which is your own? Uh, this, this is what we're called to do, brethren. We are called to overcome even as Christ overcame. I thought that was kind of an interesting way to put that. So that bears the question, how is it that Christ overcame? What was involved in that? Well, Christ overcame via an experience of suffering and sacrifice. Christ overcame death. This is, this is what, was, what he was actually called to do. This is how he overcame, through death. And this is the experience of which we must partake of if we are going to participate in the reward that's mentioned in our text this morning. Uh, Paul gave his testimony in this, in this manner when he expressed his desire to the, to the brethren at Philippi, that I, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The, it's true in a sense that we have already died with Christ in our baptism. We know this, that, 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 that we, were, we were buried with him by baptism into death, like, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Yet in another sense, it's also true that this death has a continuance. 
This is this something. This is a lifelong work. Being buried into his in being buried into his death, we began to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, this is a fellowship which must needs be experienced as long as we are in the body. For us to be able to, to receive of the ultimate experience of living with him in the ages to come, we, we have to experience the fellowship of this in the present. That this eternal experience of cooperation in his reign requires a preparation via an experience of suffering. Uh, for it, it, in uh, Second Timothy, he says it this way, it's a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. I never really read it that way before, but he doesn't say if we if we have become dead with him, but if we be dead with him. This is a, a present uh, condition, something that has to continue. And Paul gave his testimony. He said, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I have kept the, the faith. And what did he say was the reward for that? Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And I was actually... Uh, as I was going through this and reading, I was reminded of this text in 1 Kings when it talks about Solomon, about his throne, this elaborate throne that he made. And it gives this, this, this um, explanation of it. He made a great throne of ivory, and it says that he overlaid it with the best gold. Didn't just talk about it. He didn't just use any old gold, any old impure. He used the best gold. Well, brethren, if Solomon in the earth use the best gold then how what do you do you think god's going to do any less <laughs> oh, it, 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 you can be sure that if the church was gold that it, they would be the purest gold they would be the best gold in which there are no impurities so we can we can be sure of this that those who don't partake of this this process now this this process of being purified of being uh cleansed that they, they won't be in the throne then so then I, I wanted to take a minute to to open this up that what exactly all is is involved with being sat down with christ and his throne and i, I realize that there's a certain amount of mystery attended with this we really haven't been giving a, a specific itemization of, of of what's going to happen in the world to come in the work ahead but but we have been given some things there are some specific things that we know so we don't want to shy away from the things that we've been given we've been given to know a few details concerning the manner of this cooperative reign uh, first of all we know that we will be inducted into this service immediately actually via a cooperation in the judgment and and, and daniel 7 he, he kind of uh, prophesies of this he says until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and and in matthew uh he he tells the the disciples this he, peter asked him he said we've forsaken all you know what what reward is there going to be for us and jesus said uh Verily I say unto you, that which ye have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And in 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, Paul's reasoning with them on this matter, uh, talking about uh, uh, people taking their brother to judgment, you know. He said, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged to you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Mm -hmm. See, the, the, this shows you this, this truth that, that, that we're going to have this kind of cooperation in the judgment, that there isn't going to be any time of extended preparation for the work beyond this world. That, that there's not going to be any kind of orientation for heaven. There's going to be no training course when the world is over, there's, there's no moral change that's going to suddenly be experienced by somebody on that day. Um, those who have spent their lifetime in this world living for themselves and, and culturing an appetite for the things of the world, there's, there's not going to be any kind of training course that can change them to, to be pre prepared for this. Those who are going to be included in this work, they're going to pick the work up, right, at the start of the ages to come. I know for me that this, is, this has been an encouraging thought, that when I'm, tempted, when I'm tempted and when I'm tried, when I'm wronged by men or if, I, if, if I'm in any measure persecuted for righteousness sake, that it, it may very well be that, that you'll sit at the bench when the trial is called to make good what was wrong concerning that very situation. 
And, and uh, I, I, can't, I can't really speak authoritatively about this, so I won't spend an inordinate amount of time dwelling on it. But, you know, it, it may very well be that when the matter of Cain, the son of Adam, is brought up in the heavenly courts, that, that Abel will be called the witness to, 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 to give his, his uh, thoughts about this. Or, you know, those throughout the ages who are martyred for Christ, it may very well be that they, they stand in judgment of their torturers. And we, we know that the dead will be judged out of the things that are written in the book of life. And, and it seems to me that there's, there's going to be kind of some extra bits of testimony as well. You know, if Jesus is the faithful witness and, and, and we, are, we are being um, conformed into his image, I think that the, 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 the saints, they'll also be faithful witnesses to these things. But, but even more than this, this, this initial uh, inclusion in, the, in the, the, the things of the purpose of the world to come, this will only be the beginning of the work. As he continued in the seventh chapter in his vision, Daniel continued to say, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting dominion, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Amen. So, so who, who can imagine the manner of work that we're going to be involved in, in at that time? Uh, what, what words can you possibly use to be able to describe that? Uh, the, the, all, what, what I do know is that those of us who are spending our time now preparing for eternity, setting our affection on things above, laying up treasures for ourselves in heaven, walking in the spirit, crucifying the flesh, mortifying the deeds of the body. Imagine what your experience will be on that day when you receive a body like unto his glorious body. If the experience of the one who finds their bodies to be incompatible with their spirit in the present causes a cry of discontentment, like, like Paul's, Oh, wretched man that I am, then, then what is going to be the cry of your spirit when you find that there is no other law in your members? What kind of rejoicing are you going to be able to have on that day? If, if, if you spend all of your life putting your hand to the plow and laboring for the Lord despite all of the hindrances and the distractions that exist in this world, then imagine the liberty, imagine the contentment, the joy, and the rejoicing that you will have on the day that, where there is no enemy. If, if you availed yourself of all of the grace that you've been given in the present to, to obtain and to press towards the mark for the prize, regardless of what opposition may lie between you and it, imagine how you'll be able to press when there is no opposition. So, You'll be ready to like hit the ground running right at the beginning of eternity. If, if you think about it within this context... It, it really it makes sense that the saints will participate in this reign. They'll be ready for the work. We will we'll be suited for this work. The inhabitants of the church will, will, will be like any beings that ever existed in, in, in all of history and the universe. We will be very peculiar beings. I was reminded of the word that Peter gave in his second epistle when, when he spoke to them and he exhorted. And, and he said, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting Amen. kingdom. So th this is is like the, the definition of an abundant entrance. Not merely being given to enter into the realm of the, of the kingdom, but, but being put in the center of it. You're going to be in the center of all of it, of the purpose and the exercise of the will of God through eternity. You're going to be in that. Well, brethren, uh, in closing, I, I wanted to encourage you to, to take hold of this promise that, that, that he who overcomes will be granted to sit with Christ in his throne. There, there really is no reason why we cannot share in the fulfillment of this promise. Uh, all, th all things that pertain unto life and godliness have been given to us in Christ Jesus. And this, does not just, this doesn't just apply to life in this world. We're, we're talking about in the ages to come. All things. Like, like Brother Tony said, he ha he, he's got it all. It's all there in his hands. And you're going you're gonna to be involved in that. Amen. So, brethren, in the present time, let us rejoice in the assurance of our, of our coming victory. And I wanted to close um, with the words of our brother Ralph Hudson, who is among those uh, spirits of just men made perfect that we have come unto. 
Wave the banner, shout his praises, for our victory is nigh. We shall join our conquering Savior. We shall reign with him on high. Now this, imagine with the, with, with the assembled universe and the church, Jesus presenting it back to himself. What is going to be the response to this, to, to those heavenly personalities? If you want to sing with me, brethren. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of 